So thanks very much, Mark, and thanks also to Tracy and John for inviting me to speak today. Um, I thought very carefully about how I wanted to use the next 15 minutes, and what I've decided to do is to talk about ecoimmunology as a concept and the motivation behind founding this branch, and then show you a couple of case studies which sort of exemplify ecoimmunological approaches. So what is ecoimmunology? It's the study of the immune system in a real life context. It's a relatively new area of immunology. If you look for its use as a term, equimmunology in the literature, you'll see that it starts to appear around 2008 and then it really increases in frequency from then onwards. But the ideas behind equimmunology are really not new. And that is context matters. This is, a, this is an idea that's very familiar to many of us. So you know um, there are studies looking at flu vaccine where if you receive your vaccine in the morning, you may respond differently to if you receive your vaccine in the evening. Those of us who work with laboratory models will know that if you change the genotype of your animal, you may change the way the disease presenters. And equi-immunology sort of embraces that variation and tries to look to see how that variation combines to give you an immune phenotype. And of course, that immune phenotype will then impact on health, well-being, and ultimately, fitness. So as the name suggests, it sits at the interface between two very established disciplines, ecology and immunology. These are disciplines with seemingly opposing strengths. So ecology explores uncontrolled variation in a population whereas immunology tries to minimize that variation to understand mechanisms at play in individuals. So the other point I wanted to make um, while I'm on this slide is that the word ecology tends to conjure up research on, you know, you're thinking about research on wildlife and conservation, but um, ecoimmunology also embra embraces human studies. So human ecology will explore human interactions with the environment. So I think this new branch sits very well within the breadth of interests within the, within the Becker. So the name, eco-immunology. So as the, the Lydia Becker Executive Committee will testify, we spent a long time debating what would be the best name. And the name is important. It's like the title page on your book cover. You're trying to entice people inside and give them a sort of inkling about what, what the branch involves. And we talked to our colleagues in America and in the UK who were working in this sort of eco-immunology space. And we decided that eco-immunology was indeed the best um, term to capture what, what, what we, we wanted to represent. But you will also see it called wild immunology. And when we started talking with our colleagues in the Manchester Environmental Research Institute, Mary, um, we came across the term the exposome. So this is one of their themes. And this looks at how environment, lifestyle, and genome combine to predict health, with their definition of health being the presence of absence of disease, well-being, stress, and health inequalities. So why study immunology in a real world context? So in the laboratory, we strive to minimize variation. We have tremendous experimental control so that we can sort of precisely, draw, um, precisely define mechanism. Now in, that, in the wild, all the variation we strive to control in the lab is free to be at play. And so that lets us look at how all the different host intrinsic and extrinsic factors combine to determine an immune phenotype. And why is this important? Well, individuals differ in multiple ways. And this slide might seem very, very obvious. We're different in terms of our, our sex, our age, our genotype, our infections, both current infections, infection history, yes, and the microbiome, but also in ways perhaps that we as immunologists less often think about, such as space use and social behavior. <laughs> 
And we can look to see how all these different extrinsic and intrinsic factors combine to determine an immune phenotype. And particularly if we're working with humans or wild animals that are model organisms, such as Mus musculus, then we can actually apply all of the immunological toolbox that we have worked up to precisely sort of define the innate immune response, the adaptive immune response. We can look in the bone marrow and look for immune cell progenitors and see how um, these multiple variables combine to shape this overall immune response. So what can we learn? So we understand that immune responses are energetically costly. So we, when it's integrated with the rest of our physiology, so immune response comes at a cost. And what this means is, if you think about it, is that um, how immune responses are prioritized will differ between individuals, but also within an individual over time. And if we then start to move from individuals to populations, the ecoimmunology approach will um, allow us to understand how populations and indeed species are going to respond to environmental challenge. And that's important as this cartoon uh, tries to remind us. What can we learn? Well, there's a lot of really interesting paper com papers coming out in this space. And I'm a big fan of the work of this French consortium who are looking at um, heritable and non-heritable drivers of immune variation. In complete contrast, there's some fabulous work coming out from the Soe sheep people who work on St. Kilda. And one of their recent papers, for example, shows that maternally derived anti-helmic antibodies um, predict offspring survival, so uh, a, a signature of fitness. And what will be being in a Lydia Becker branch enable? Well, we're really looking forward to nurturing a wide community of practice, and we want to build links with, I've mentioned Mary already, um, but also um, the university's challenge um, area of, of sustainable futures. Um, it'll help us consolidate and enable sharing of skill sets. So ecological data is inherently linked to time and space. So for example, if we wanted to understand how inflammatory responses are structured spatially and temporally, we need to employ spatiotemporal models. Now, they're not an immunologist's bread and butter. Well, they're certainly not my bread and butter, but ec ecologists use these types of modeling strategies all the time. And so it'll allow us to learn and consolidate those skill sets. It'll help us build critical mass. Of course, it'll provide visibility to the outside world that Manchester is doing um, eco-immunology work. It'll help support grant funding bids. So this idea of creating a research environment, long-term, it would be really fun to work with Mary and other areas of the university to perhaps establish um, a DTP in this area. And how do we see ecoimmunology uh, fitting in the Becker? And this is our vision. And it's a vision of bridging. So it's bridging between the laboratory studies where we have this precise control so we can define mechanism and the fully wild systems where all the variables are free to be at place, at play. And what you can see are there are transitions between the lab and, and the fully wild system. So we can start adding variables, and many of us do this. We change the diet or we change the genotype and we, or put, put infection in. So you can start adding variables um, to lab animals. You can mature lab animal immune systems in the context of wild animal microbiomes. And you can start developing um, semi-wild systems where you release lab animals into outdoor enclosures. So we can be begin to naturalize our lab um, animals. And we can go the other way. We can start adding control to the wild animal systems. So we can do interventions in wild animals. We can house, we can short-term house wild animals in a more controlled environment. And ultimately, we would be able to establish 
wild animals in laboratory-based um, systems. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a couple of case studies, one of which embraces this part of, of this schematic, so an idea of naturalizing a lab study, and then I'm going to show you what, what is an aspirational study that we are hoping to do, where we're going to add an intervention to a, woolly, a fully wild um, population of, of mice. So I'm going to start um, with the naturalizing approach. And this is the work from one of our colleagues in America, Andrea Graham. And she's really pioneered this idea of using enclosures so you can use semi-wild systems. Um, and so she's got these um, eight wedge-shaped outdoor enclosures, which in total cover 1.5 kilometers squared. And she releases lab mice into these en enclosures. So the study I'm going to show you, I think it's absolutely fascinating, but it also gives me this massive excuse to show you a parasite life cycle, which is, uh, those of you who know me well, is something that has been a long, long-standing interest of mine. And it also gives me the excuse to go through the life cycle, and I'm not just indulging myself, it allows me... Uh, to show you the days post-infection relative to the larval molts, which is important with what Andrea then went on, on to do. So the centerpiece here is an adult Trichuris muris. This is um, a gut-dwelling nematode parasite of mice. Mice become infected when they ingest embryonated eggs. These contain an L1. The L1 hatch in the cecum. And then uh, you get the classic nematode molts from L1 to L2, L2 to L3, and this is around day 21 post-infection, L3 to L4, L4 to adult, and then um, the adults, the female adults, will shed eggs into the external environment. So what Andrea did, she worked with C57 black six mice. So she's controlling for age, she's controlling for genotype, she's controlling for sex. So she's controlling host intrinsic factors. And she released these animals into um, the enclosures at different times post-infection. So she'd got three groups of mice. She's got her lab-maintained mice. So the C these were C57 black six mice, which were infected in the lab kept in the mice in the lab and cooled at uh, week three or week four. She then had what she called her short-term wilded mice, which were kept in the lab. They were infected in the lab. And then they were released into the enclosures, I think around day 10 post-infection, so a time point that, that relates to the, the second larval stage. And then they were re-caught at week three and week four and cold. And then she had a third group. These were her long-term wild um, animals. And these were C57 black six released into the enclosure. They were caught, infected, released again, caught at week three. Some of them were cold, caught, caught at week four, and some of them were cold. And this is uh, some of her data. It's a, it's a really interesting paper if you're interested. So this is worm burden. This is the lab-maintained mice that were kept in the lab, infected in the lab, and cold while still in the lab. And this is totally as we would expect. The worms have, expel, have been expelled. But look what happens to your worm burden if the mice have experienced time in the wild. They've become more susceptible to infection, whether this is a short-term wild or a long-term wilded animal. And she also looked at worm, worm biomass. And it always amazes me when, when I re-look at this data because not only do the worms survive better uh, in mice that have been in a natural environment, they also grow better, so the biomass is bigger. They're happy, healthy, chunkier worms, in effect. And because um, Andrea was working with um, lab mice, c 57 black six, she could then throw at it all the usual immunology uh, that we like to look at. And she looked, I'm just showing you a little bit of her data here, but this is worm burden against R13 positive CD4 cells in mesenteric lymph nodes, or worm burden against uh, gamma interferon positive CD4 cells. And you can see that as worm burden decreases, you get more of the type two cells, and as worm burden increases, so these triangles and squares are our wilded mice, 
then um, the type 1 response becomes dominant. And this is the same data again, which is but plotted against worm mass. So the last study I want to show you is it's, it's an aspirational study that we want to do, um, and it asks this question, eosinophils, what do they do? <laughs> Um, and this question has arisen from work that we are doing and have been doing over the last four years on the Isle of May, which is um, an island off the coast of Scotland. And it's home to a population of feral wild, um, of feral lab mice, so a wild house mouse, mus musculus. Um, so again, just to reiterate that, let's just use this powerful immunological toolbox that we all, all uh, use in lab settings. So over those four years, we've established three trapping grids. These are 96 trap grids. And the study itself, the, the study we were funded to do, um, involve, it's a longitudinal study where we capture the mice, we mark them, we release them, we recapture them. Some of the mice receive a vaccine. We use a model vaccine. So we can look at the drivers of immune variation uh, in the context of this model vaccine. So that was the study we, we are doing, and we're still doing that study. But in the process of doing that study, we stumbled across a really unusual phenotype for the eosinophil. So the eosinophil is present in very high numbers um, in the tissues. We've looked at spleen, we've looked at bone marrow, we've looked at gut in these wild mice. Not only, and they, they appear in much bigger numbers than you'd see in a laboratory setting, and they also have a really unusual phenotype, a phenotype that's rarely seen in laboratory mice. Eosinophils are an evolutionally conserved cell type. And as I said right at the start, um, investment in the immune system is energetically costly. So if you think about it, for a cell type to have been maintained for 450 million years in vertebrates, it must be doing something fundamentally important. The gut is home to the largest number of eosinophils of any tissue. Um, and gut eosinophils, they've been variably ascribed pathogenic, antiparasitic, and homeostatic roles. We don't really know what the gut eosinophil does. We don't know if it drives damage, pathogenesis, or supports tissue integrity. So we hypothesize that the clean conditions that we use in the lab mice I mean we can't fully see the protective and or restorative function of the eosinophils. So that's the question that we want to ask. Um, and I'll show you the template, the sort of schematic of how we're going to approach that um, study. But first I want to take you to the island. So this is the Isle of May. So we go over on, a, on what is a, a motorized rib. We use Longworth traps. So these are our, our live traps. And at any one uh, trapping session, we may have 300 of these traps out on those three grids across the island. We work in one of the outsheds to process the mice. So this is, this is tagging the mouse. Um, we take samples of blood. We take um, feces for microbiome analysis. And some of the mice are, are vaccinated as well, um, and this is all prior to re-release and capture. And we've got a sort of pop-up lab. So we take all this kit over with us, but we, we can do tissue culture, we've got a CO2 incubator, um, and we, we do all our flow staining on site and all our re-stims on site so that we can then come back to Manchester and characterize the immune responses in detail. So the, what we want to do at this study site is to employ an eosinophil depleting intervention. So we want to um, capture the mice, divide them into cohorts. Some of them are going to be depleted of eosinophils, and then we're going to ask um, how this affects the gut pathology and gut barrier integrity, the composition of the gut immune cells, and, and the IgA and the gut microbiome responses. And all this is in the context of these multiple um, intrinsic and extrinsic variables. <laughs> 
And that's where I would like to leave it. I hope it's given you a flavour of what eco-immunology is in the context of, of the Becker. I think there's really opportunities for, for lots of synergy and growth um, and, and working together. I'd like to acknowledge, acknowledge uh, the WILD team members, um, particularly Jan Bradley, who's at the University of Nottingham, who sort of set me off on this adventure uh, many years ago, and Iris Nair, who is one of the new University Pereira Fellows, and also, with the, you know, we enjoy bashing around ideas and, and, um, and eco-immunology concepts. Iris has a poster, if you want to go and look at that, as has George Ad Adams, who's also um, part of this sort of eco-immunology branch. The Isle of May staff. Um, and yeah, the deputy branch leads are Sheena Cruikshank and Suzanne Schultz. We are a newly formed branch. Um, and so if you'd like to become affiliated with the eco-immunology branch, then just email us um, and we'll add you to the sort of list so you can hear what's going on within this, within this space. Okay, thank you. So I've got one, so that I really like the slide that you have so showing you know, the lab models versus the natural and then trying yeah. to go in between them. Obviously, having big spaces outside is difficult for a lot of, kind of city universities. Are there what do you think are maybe some of the more important but things that we could do that doesn't require the space? Yeah. Things like changing the diet to be more natural and, and light. Uh, yes. The genetics of the mice. Do you think that there's going to be push in that direction? Um, I, th I think we need to think beyond changing just one or two variables. I think we've got to look at changing multiple variables because that's the real life context and, 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 and the real world. Um, I think we can do things like take wild microbiome and put them into lab-based um, models. So that will obviously... Um, change the context that the mice see whatever um, offering we're going to give them. We can potentially do the sort of semi-wild enclosures. Um, we work a little bit with Jane Hurst at the Leehurst campus, who, who is over at Liverpool University, and she has um, the sorts of enclosure setups that I showed you um, that Andrea Graham is using in America. And of course, just limiting ourselves to a mouse discussion now because there's all the human immunology that, that's going on anywhere, which is context in the real world. Uh, we hope that the, the Isle of May mice are going to become a resource that everyone will be able to, to use and ask questions over. And that's definitely one of the ambitions for this branch, I think. Mary's doing a lot of work with the um, environment in Manchester and yeah. looking at particulate matter in air and things. Do you th do you think there's just that are sufficiently different from one another to be able to see these changes in patients or humans in general? I think so long as you've got a big enough cohort, you can manage. If this is your question, Tracy, you can manage the multiple variables that are going in. So long as you've got a so one of the, the things with eco-immunology studies, you've got to have a really good starting population so that once you start stratifying, you can still see phenotype. But yes, absolutely, I think so.